All I right, Kingsley. What's that on, Chris? I oh didn't know basketball gosh. Ken was a, an icon. Yeah, no, absolutely. I guess, I, guess, is. I guess they are. He's yeah. on this show, okay. mate. Nice. So, nice. Look, look, so many questions. I know mm-hmm. you're as excited as I am, aren't you? I'm Just happy to be here, man. Generally. I can't remember when I was last here, but it's nice to be here. Rolling Stone magazine. Here we go. Rolling Stone magazine, February issue. Uh, big interview with you here. You say, I really felt like I wasn't right for it. I don't sing, I don't dance, and there was nothing physically similar that meant I could really convince people I was him. Discuss. I, I stand by that, yeah. No, that was my first feeling. That, that I, I was, I, I would love to play Bob, you know, but I just wanted to make sure that the family and, and the studio and the director and everyone knew, you know. I was like, do they know I can't sing and I can't dance and I... I'd be really starting from scratch yeah. and, you know, Jamaican Patois, that's a whole thing, you know. It's so, I was just a little bit nervous that they didn't know. And so, you know, they 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 found out and they were cool with it, so. So you said I can't dance. What you meant was I couldn't dance, past tense now. I couldn't, couldn't. sing. No, I've had, I've had a bit of dancing this yeah, year. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, and playing the guitar. Oh, yeah. as I say, so, so many questions. Is it true that you actually, did you turn down the role no 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 it was just before the audition i i just called my agent was like do they know i can't sing right because one of the auditions was to sing and to play the guitar right so i was like i better not do that yeah. because if i do that then i can I'm ride not a get horse the job. but i can't do any of those i can't things. do that <laughs> so i just picked one i just picked bob talking in the studio and, and we went from there but it was immediately you know i sent the audition tape and the family watched it the next day and then they said yeah we want to meet him right so then I flew out and I was with the family, like almost, you know, within a week, you know, I was at Ziggy's house and, you know, I was with Stephen and Ryan and Sadella. And so it was, it started straight away. And well, was... they say, don't they, it's everything is slow until it's quick. Yeah. So this was a slow build, but then once the decision had been made, you were, everybody was all in. It was, we were off. There was no time to celebrate. There was no time to feel anything other than there is so much work to do to try and become this man who the whole look, he's one of the you know top five most recognizable faces in the planet everyone knows him he's a hero he's an icon his music is has transcended the culture yeah. he's ev- bob is everywhere every shop you go into every other shop you go into they're playing him you know yeah. so it was um yeah there was a lot of work to do and i really found bob you know which is really unique in in terms of like acting process with his family and his friends. Yeah. So like there was all the books, but after you read the books, you're like, I need to go straight to the source. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time with guys who grew up with Bob in Trenchtown who knew him before he was famous and they'd walk me around the neighborhood and show me. So I was trying to absorb as much as I could about who Bob was outside of the legend. You know, who was Bob at home? Who was Bob as a father? Who was Bob, you know, in his, in his quiet moments? What were his struggles? What did he go through? And I was able to get all of that information from people who were there with him at the time. I mean, we had Neville Garrick you know, Bob's really close friend, an artistic uh, director who who was with Bob when he was writing Exodus in Battersea. And he was in the room with me when I was trying to play oh those scenes. God. So we had all of, you know, the authenticity of the movie and really representing how Bob spoke and the culture. 98% of everyone involved was Jamaican. It was just me, Anthony Welsh and Tossin Cole who weren't. So we were fully supported. See, it's funny, it's like being at school, isn't it? Because you can do the theory till the cows come home, but it's when you do the practical that it gets in there, the knowledge gets in there. That's what you're doing. You know, you're doing your practical over your theory. Uh, I suppose you could write the book now playing Bob Marley. You could probably do that. You know, from a a ready, steady cook point of view, you know, they get all the ingredients like what we're going to use here. What do you need to do? So so can you get over-informed? Did you, you know, can you know too much about him? Because then you've got to decide which bits you're going to use. Absolutely. I think at some point, you know, I learned you know, don't overburden yourself with backstory that's not important. Yeah. So it's good to to know and understand everything and yeah. have a kind of, you know, to understand. But at the end of the day, it's like, how do I play Bob within this story? And mm. the story is really about this trauma that happened, this attempted assassination. They all nearly died and that really happened. And then within 12 weeks, Bob had come to London and he'd created this masterpiece. And so the transference of that really intense moment where they all nearly died, went straight into the creation of this album Exodus and I hope the audience come and they get a little insight into how that album came together you know Bob so many things but what was great about hanging out with his friends and people who were there at the time they said he was so intense you know the creation of that album was so intense and he was up at five in the morning and he was writing before the sun came up and he was out running he was really this there was this intensity that he had to like create 
And uh, I just, I, I found it really interesting that he'd nearly died 12 weeks before. Crazy. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know any of the story. Yeah. I thought I knew some of the story. I, did, I didn't know any Same of the Same as me. Yeah. I, I, I honestly, I look back and I go, I really didn't know anything at all yeah. about Bob I thought I did I yeah. thought oh yeah he's great I know a few of the songs I thought the same thing yeah you know? yeah he was he Bob was from Bob was from the ghetto you yeah. know he grew up in Trenchtown you know he's Bob is a poet and a beautiful humble kind loving human being but he was also this general you know they called him the tough gong they called him the skip and uh you know so there was all of these sides to his personality all of these colors that i was finding out from you know people who knew him just to make him feel as real as possible so if it was this sort of virtual um screen you know like in um uh born identity where they grab things out of the air and they put it onto this virtual screen and mm -hmm. you know what do you, you know what are you grabbing the the i i understand the, the two sort of main lanes were the human and the artist would you say that's about right that's where you that's the two things you had to meld together yeah it was the human being and then there was the artist and they were in a way sort of different beings living in the same body from the same spirit is it true that as an artist, in many ways, he was a bit method, almost like he was playing himself in as much as one of the reasons he would step till five o'clock in the morning is because his voice was more hoarse then yeah. and he preferred that yeah. sound on the recording. Is that all true? Yes, yeah, all true, man. Bob was, Bob was a really spiritual guy, you know, like he was a, Bob was a, Bob was a deep guy. I think he found, you know, he found, they didn't have therapists back then. Those guys, they weren't going to therapy on Wednesdays. They, they found their safety in their community, in their religion, in their beliefs, in football. They found it in music, you know? So I feel like Bob's guitar, you know, really saved him as a child. That was my interpretation anyway. He found like, he was a, he's a kid from the ghetto yeah. and he found music and he loved music and you can only write that many. Do you know how hard it is to write one hit song? I you mean, had a go, I, didn't you? I had a go and I couldn't, I mean, I was, it was so bad. And I was like, Bob didn't just write one. He wrote hit after hit yeah. after hit yeah. after hit, and to the the dedication and the, that he put into his craft. I mean, we all know because the songs are, you know, it's they're genius. But they're beyond human, though. You're right because that's what you're describing, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's beyond human ability and capacity. They must be coming from somewhere else because if you get the chords right, you may get them in the wrong order. If you get them in the right order, you might get the rhythm wrong. You yeah. might pick an electric guitar over an acoustic guitar. And then the lyrics have got to come on top and then the chorus has got to go yeah. in the right place. This is, it's too, it's too um, complex for it to happen by chance. Mm -hmm. This must be being channeled from somewhere via, via him to the rest of us. Yeah, he believed Bob, Bob was on a mission, you know, like you can only have that amount of fire and determination and lack of sleep and commitment if, <laughs> if music is everything to you, you know? And, I, and and that's really, I learned that through talking to so many people who were just like, yeah, Bob worked, man. Like this idea of chill out, Rasta, that yeah, we all yeah, have, yeah. it's really like Bob, Bob was into self-betterment and, you know, self-care and looking after yourself and finding out what your dreams are and, and being who you want to be before it was a thing on YouTube, you know? Yeah, that yeah. was like, that was the vibe. And and then obviously when you're, when you're learning that about him, obviously I, I, I picked up on so much of it, you know. It's like his work ethic was was something that's really stayed with me, you know. To write that many hit songs, you have to, you know, isolate yourself and be in a kind of zone in a way so you're ready to find inspiration from anywhere. And that's what it sounds like he was doing. You know, when he was in Battersea, Neville Garrick told me, I said, what was Bob like at that time, you know? He was like, he said he didn't really go out, you know? He didn't really go out. He was really just trying to create the album and you know so yeah it was it was amazing to uh to learn about his human side you know well they say that are geniuses you know they they are to, in order to to come up with the body of work they end up coming up with you know or, or if they're still alive currently are still coming up with you have to spend 99.9% .9 of your time in private mm -hmm. but because you what you've created is so good it just seems like you're ever present yeah and like, and it just came out, like it came out of nowhere exactly you know, and that's how i feel about the you know the the universal ideas that bob got to so peace and love and unity and togetherness you know which is what the movie's kind of exploring like the journey that it took bob you know to get there he didn't just wake up and come out with peace love and unity yeah, so yeah. so it, it, there was a whole set of struggles that he went through to arrive there and he and he we we lost him at 36 which was a tragedy so i feel like for me coming in to play him it was amazing to try and understand where bob stood with those things so like inner peace you know and yeah. self-love yeah. and like the togetherness of himself and you know so 
the themes were working externally and internally because the family said to me from the beginning they want to make a deep movie they want to share a side to Bob that the fans don't really know and so as an actor I was like well I'm all in you know this is not about mimicking him you can't mimic Bob you can't copy him you can't choreograph him it's he's kind of he's a one of a kind so it felt really good for me in a way to have all of the family say it's just a spirit thing yeah if we can just try and the movie is about trying to tap into Bob's spirit and it is a love letter from the family to their dad to say we see you and we love you and there's music and there's joy and there's like community and family and concert scenes and arguments and some fights and everything so I feel like it's a movie where you know you know we can you can bring the kids you can bring grandma and granddad you can bring everyone and I feel like because there was such a there was such a uh, uh, a commitment from the heads of Paramount, from all of the Mali family, and from myself. We all agreed at the beginning that, you know, Jamaican Patois has to be represented properly in this film. Yeah. We can't do a version of it. To, you know, it's like we, if we're going to do a movie about Bob, we have to talk like Bob talked. And that to me made me feel like, okay, cool. I, I'm, I'm happy. I want to jump on board and be a part of this. There's a great line in the film where it says, uh, Bob's wife says, sometimes the messenger has to become the message. Mm -hmm. It's a killer line. I mean, I haven't seen the film, but I've watched as many clips as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I've seen the film. Yeah. And I've read loads of interviews you've done about it, but I thought, what a great line. You know, sometimes the messenger has to become the message. And then here's you having to play the messenger that becomes the message. <laughs> yeah. so you're the messenger. <laughs> About of the, the message, message of the guy who's the, the message. Yeah, I mean, yeah, come on. Yeah. You look at the smile you're talking oh, about it with. It's Bob, man. I feel like it was such a joy, you know, because <laughs> his research involved listening to him and listening to his music, you know. Hours and hours. I'm uh, yeah, hour, but joyful hours. Of course, you know, of you wake up in I wake up in the morning, I make a cup of tea, you know, when when I was you know prepping and I go, I'm just gonna go walk for five hours and listen to Bob interviews and listen right. to him talking and listen to him. You know, and he's funny as well and he 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 had he had such a strong point of view, you know? I feel like one of the things I respect about Bob is that he stuck to his guns and he, 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 he really had his beliefs, you know? And he was singing. I always, like, imaginatively, you know, I was like, the reason why you can't copy him is because he's singing for his life, you know, when he's up on that stage. There's no... There was no half-hearted days with him. There was no like, oh, we just had a, a half show, you know. Everything was full commitment, full energy. He really felt like he was in service to something higher. Yeah. And, you know, it's hard to disagree with that because the music is, is still here and it still lives on. Do you know what's so mad? Everyone outside of Jamaica, I don't think they understand half the lyrics and they still feel the music. Yeah. So Bob's music is so powerful that like, we don't even know half of what he's saying in them, you know? We know the choruses and we know the big lines, but I had to be really honest with myself, you know, a few months in and go, I need help translating some of the songs and some of these interviews because, yeah. you know, the Jamaican patois can, it can be really heavy and complex and it's its own language in a way. Um, and even though I've grown up with Jamaicans, the, the, the patois and the way Bob speaks was something that needed a huge amount of work. Like normally on films, you have one dialect coach. We had a, a language team of nine, you know, nine people, J you know, Jamaican linguists from the university. I mean, we had a whole team and we were trying to find a way to take bits from like Bob's interviews and incorporate them in the script because everyone in Jamaica would say, you know the funny thing about Bob? Bob talked the way Bob talked. You know, no one talked like him. Oh Bob, he picked up words from like Europe. He picked <laughs> up luck, words Kingsley. from America, you know? So I was like, okay, How were wow. you at languages at school? Uh, not great, not bad. I loved French for a minute, you right. know? When I was 15, I was I like, oh, I think we all love French for a minute. Yeah, I was like, I'd be great to learn it. And then I was like, oh, what it takes to learn French. I've got to go to France to tomorrow to do some interviews in French. But I think you get one of those earpieces. Let's hope can, so. Yeah. yeah, I shouldn't think you'll be yeah, fine anyway. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, the uh, the film's already seen its world premiere in Jamaica. First what premiere. What was that like? It was, it was, it was beautiful. It was, um, it was really... I mean, I found it pretty surreal, you know, I had to, I, f I went into this state of like really calm because I just wanted to kind of absorb what was going on and how much he means to people there. And it was huge, man. They locked down half of Kingston, you know, all the roads shut down. So it was, you know, and Bob's family and grandchildren were playing on a stage and uh, it was just incredible. It was, um, it's pretty surreal. I feel like 
in two, three years, I'll look back and be like, that was yeah. so mad. It's become normal to just send Ziggy a message yeah. and check in and, the fa you know, to be so close to the family. Learning about Bob Marley through his friends and family. I was like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's so it's mad. So it's so like, yeah, anyone, you, anything you want to know, you could just call Did someone. Did you ever imagine? <laughs> never, never in my life. And I got close to playing some big parts that never happened. But never in my wildest dreams would I have thought it would be Bob, you know? I never, ever would have thought that I'd be in this situation playing Bob. It's very surreal and it's, it's um, yeah, Bob's got so much goodwill as well. It's like, I've just, you know, so many people love him. They're just coming out for him. You the know? resurgence of his music is going to be huge, isn't yeah, it, by the film? I, I hope um, so. It can get more surreal, and it did get more surreal because you had a Bob station, and it was referred to as the Bob station, built by the beautiful people <laughs> who you're working for making the Barbie movie. Because no, they didn't build it. The, the set was built already. I, you know, it's like on film sets where you've got so much downtime. When yeah. they say cut, you've got hours. Oh, my God. And hurry so, up and wait. Yeah, hurry up and wait. Yeah. And I was like, I, I got the offer to play Bob sort of a few days before I started Barbie, and I was, I was going to be on Barbie <laughs> for three and a half months, and I was like, I can't waste these three and a half months. I need to start working so I just I just bought my guitar and my laptop just behind the Mojo Dojo castle and when they say cut I just start you know doing little chords and, and just getting the foundations in you know but Greg did not build me the a Bob, Bob station the Bob station is like I mean it's <laughs> the, out there let's just go yeah, with it no the story keeps changing it's like Chinese whispers it's, it's um I built I built my I built a little space for my laptop and my tea a and my work guitar station, yeah work, a like. workstation okay, yeah, yeah it was so a workstation funny. so funny isn't it I like it it's a story that they say what does it say um, if you tell a good story it's half around the world before the truth gets its undercrackers on but anyway um so so you'd never played the guitar before so no. you couldn't sing um you couldn't dance you said i bet you could you couldn't sing you couldn't a little dance. bit just like when you're going out and you have a dance yeah you know, and um you couldn't play guitar could you play football because that was the fourth thing really no, wasn't it no no I, he was I, a great I, footballer wasn't he, was, he? he could have been semi-pro right. i think he could have been semi-pro i thought he could have played the prem but he was really good but yeah. bob's a lot smaller than me right so bob's five foot bob was five foot seven i'm six foot two nearly okay so it, the, I, I, I love football and I grew up with guys who you know were scouted at Arsenal and went on to play so I know I know where I'm at with it right. Bob's got a low centre of gravity I'm very gangly and like I'm, I'm, so he I've can drop a, the shoulder he can drop the shoulder I've got a bent foot you know you want to put me right at the back in the middle or on the right and just stand there and just rough people yeah, up. Yeah. I can't play, play. Tony Adams. Yeah, a bit of that. Yeah, it'll be all right. Though. If anything. So <laughs> I, I got, we got, we got some coaches in, I think one from Arsenal and, you know, there was a semi-pro who came in and, you know, it was just about finding, finding looking the, like you yeah, might look, have yeah. the balance. Yeah. On I would only just do like three or four second choreographed right. bits, like, to, to receive the ball, take it in, vision, pass it on. And Bob looked like, Bob Bob was great at football. You can see, great footballers have vision. So it's actually about taking the ball and then seeing where yeah. it needs to go. So it was just like trying to cheat all of those things. Yeah, the ball's, the ball, the ball's done. It's a done deal at your feet. It's, yeah. And then you have the extra capacity to look around. Exactly. That's the thing. Yeah. It's like when you know a role really well or the line's really well, you can start playing with it. Yeah, you can start playing it. Exactly like that. Yeah. His football was like a religion to him yeah. as well as his religion. Love sucker. Um, That's what he said. <laughs> very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love Bob it. I love you still love doing the voice. He love football. You do all the time. He says it so much, though, you know. He's like, yeah, he loves playing soccer. You know, he. he every um, day, yeah? Every day. Couple I think they, yeah, they wake up, they go for a run, they come back, they have a juice, then they do football. And then this was all at Hope Road. And then after football, they're in the studio, free till free, you know, free till wow. free. They just won't come out. They they, they they played football and they I, ran and they... I had a mate who played against him in Hyde Park. No way. Five a side, literally jumpers for goalposts. No way. Yeah, back in the day. Wow. So how much Adidas stuff do you, did you get? <laughs> Which one? How much a, what? Adidas stuff. How much, did you, how much gear did oh, you get? Oh, I ain't had anything from Adidas. Oh, but I mean, in the movie, you're wearing Oh, yeah, no, but they never give you those... Co no, I never get my costumes. I feel, only, that's, only Samuel Jackson and Robert De Niro can do that. They just, you know, they... Other people steal. We've had them on the show. They steal a lot. I try not to steal. Try, try because, theft. Yeah, maybe maybe I should. I just, I'm watching my reputation, you know. We were talking yesterday because we, we were so excited about you coming on about the fact that he may well, well have been the first icon to wear sports gear as fashion wear. Not that yeah. maybe that was his, his intention at the time. Yeah. But, I mean, that is very much part of the culture. It's very much a signature in the film. Yeah, he's cool, man. Bob was a cool cat. Like, he, um, and because he didn't try he didn't try it. He had yeah. a couple of pieces that he liked yeah. and it was always like old stuff. He put no, he didn't really think about it. I think that's why he's cool because he just, you know, he did, he did what he wanted to you do. You can't what, try and be cool. 
You no, can only exactly. Be cool, yeah, you? exactly. So this guitar thing, right? It's apparently you, you play guitar for ten weeks till your fingers bled, literally. Uh, Did I Brandon say that? Adams, till my fingers bled. Not somewhere. bled, not bled. But someone said to me that you know you know you're getting somewhere yeah. when you get those blisters, calluses. Yeah, when you so up. I was trying my best, you know, to just when I started seeing them and when I couldn't feel, I was like, oh, I've obviously made a little bit of progress. Well, well done. I mean, and this sort of ten week pre. Uh, initial 10 week preparation period you had for the movie was in fact extended in the end wasn't yeah, it because yeah. of various things oh, we and needed you said it. thank god thank god yeah no I mean you can't I mean I could have taken three and I, I, there were days where I was like I need five years for this <laughs> you know I, I, could, I need to move I you're need never going to gonna be ready no you're never going to exactly you're never going to be ready and you know I wanted to live in Jamaica for much longer but you know it was we had the time we had and the family were involved. There was a huge amount of trust. Everyone involved had so much love for Bob. And so I felt, I felt like, I felt really, you know, safe with, um, you know, but it's like having Neville there on set. I knew, and this is what I love about Jamaicans. If they don't like something, they're going to tell you, yeah, yeah. you know? So I always knew if Ziggy doesn't like something or if something didn't feel right, we had the time and the space to stop, stop what we were doing. Everyone sit down. If we don't know what's going on, let's go back and listen to Bob. Let's listen to what Bob actually said around this time and try and figure out a way to make it feel real. There's so many moments in the film. I was watching it the other day and I was like, I can see the moments where we did that and we stopped and we took the time and we listened to Bob and we just added another layer in that feels like, it, you know, honors him in a way, you know. Um, he was, he's his person that there was so, this is the interesting thing about Bob is that he was, he could be really, really tough, you know, but he could be really, really kind. He could be really, really like, he was such a, a complex human being. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, so finding all of those colors. He was the, all the onion, wasn't he? All the He layers. was all the onion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was on a mad one. Like, yeah. Can I you, did, without being indiscreet, could you give us an example of when you had to stop and, and dive a bit deeper into him and say, this isn't working or? Just, you know, you can't, Bob's not an American dad. So if you want to put Bob in a movie, you've got to be really, really careful about sentimentality and the nuance of his vulnerability has to be really carefully thought out. You know, you ask people about Bob, Bob's not just going to come and cry in a scene. He doesn't, have, like, you can't just have Bob crying like in one of those American films where he's just, because that wasn't Bob. They called him the tough gong. So I had to really think about safety and inner peace and like what it means to be a to have that tough exterior like what it means to be a workaholic like what it means you know and and with that you start understanding what bob went through as a kid you know and like i identified with with the ghetto man the guy who came from nothing you know i really I really understood him on that level through spending so much time with his friends and family and i was with a guy called lego um, who grew up with, Bob, you know, who knew Bob when he was 13. And he's got this studio in, on Orange Street in Trenchtown. And I went down there with Lego and we were just walking around and he was just showing me where they'd hang out. He was showing me where Bob first was playing. Like, it was so mad. So I feel like, I can't really remember what your question was other than... Um, <laughs> it, was, you know, it was the nuances within the Yeah, the, so the, all the of takes. that, whenever we were doing something that had, like, real emotional cost... Yeah. With Ziggy and with Neville and with everyone, it was about going, we want to be really careful about how we represent him yeah, in yeah. these moments. And Bob's vulnerability was, the, that was the movie for me. I'm and his sure. strength. Yeah, exactly. That's the whole point. Exactly. Yeah. So you can come across as over hard. I, would, I haven't seen the film, but I could come across as over hard. But it was because he was so at peace, uh, knowing that what he was doing for the right reasons, he saw it doesn't matter what anybody thinks in the moment because mm -hmm. there's a longer game here. There's a more mm -hmm. important thing going on here that mm -hmm. he didn't maybe have time to to to, to communicate to people because he had to get on with it. Yeah, and no and time it, to. He said, "I got and, no time to waste." And so the movie is it is it half and half, half Jamaica, half London, or how does it work chronologically? In terms of what do you think of the film, by the way? You've seen it. What do you think of it? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a love letter, man. It's beautiful. You happy? Yeah, I'm really am. Um, I think you. we 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 you know there was a huge. It was a it was a labour of love. I was going to ask you, had you seen it? Because it's not always the case. No, I, listen, I, I'm the first person to say, don't ask me because I'm watching it in a completely different headspace. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the edit. I'm looking at the cut. I'm looking at the scene. I'm remembering the day. I'm remembering the before. I'm, 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 
it will take me a few years to watch anything in a headspace where I can be sort of objective. If ever. You Jeez. know, if ever, yeah, 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 exactly. And it's not for me, you know, it's not for me. It's my job's done and it's about people were coming in for the first time to see it. I, I remember the script from the, the first draft. I've, it, the process has been, you know, it's been such a long process and the film changed. So it's really difficult to, for me to say. Um, but uh, what was the question? So you Jamaica asked? versus London. Oh, Jamaica versus London. Yeah. I, yeah, we started in London, seven, eight weeks in London. And then we had a week and then we went to Jamaica and did the last seven, eight weeks in Jamaica. Right, right. Um, and yeah, and they were two completely different experiences. And it, it, this is a film that's nearly been made a few times before finally your creation. You, I guess so. That's what I heard, yeah. Yeah, and I think various illustrious producers were, I think Spielberg had mm -hmm. a look at it and I think Scorsese had a look at it for a while as right. well. And I think the, the in the end, your producer was drawn to it or the family was drawn to it. I can't remember which way it round it was because he said somebody said let's not do a, a life story let's do a this two three year story yeah which is is fantastic in a way isn't it because sometimes a life can be too big even for a really clever filmmaker yeah but and that's it gives me goosebumps just talking about that decision mm -hmm. it's a great decision that isn't it i think so yeah i think so i think this period's really interesting like uh, you know the 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 assassination attempt yeah and and how how close how close how close successful. it came yeah i mean they all nearly died and there's a civil war going on in jamaica it was yeah. a really really dangerous situation bob was in and he decided to put on this concert to try and bring a little bit of lightness and, and togetherness in the country and, they and people want it. yeah people were telling him not to do it because yeah. it was going to make him look like he was taking sides with the political leaders and all of that it was really going on and you know and people were coming to the house and warning him but bob was like no it's for the people i'm doing it it's just music i'm not taking sides and then bang it went off you know and they you know don taylor i mean he was airlifted to miami but the bullet i mean the bullet grazed across Bob's chest and lodged into his arm. So yeah. if he'd have been one, like, if he'd just been a little bit of a different angle, that would have went straight for his heart. And Rita, the bullet was in her head and her dreadlock stopped it. The, the dread, Her dreadlock stopped the bullet from lodging into her brain. So no joke, I, I really, I spoke to surviving band members who told me that the trauma of that night hasn't left them hasn't left them. So it was imaginatively for me, I'm going, we're going in to make a movie about the creation of this album off the back of that trauma. Yeah. I just wanted to find out what it was like, you know, when Bob was in Battersea and what was going on for the time at the time with him on a personal level. And I had all of the people around me to tell me, you know, I was like, I read all the books and I was like, this is, these are just books, these books ain't gonna, you know, I got so many stories. And when you're talking to them, when you're talking to people, they give you all their sound bites. So they, you know, a lot of them have done documentaries on Bob and people, you know, everyone, everyone's they got their spent stick. their lives talking yeah. about Bob, yeah, you know, yeah. and he, everyone loves him so much. So it took, sometimes it would take two or three hours to, to get kind past of, that. to get past it, yeah. to, to, to try and, get them to understand that what I'm trying to get to is like Bob as a human. Yeah, it's not I, the anecdotes. Not the anecdotes. I want to know what was he like in yeah. private? Did what, he do the dishes? Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. What was he like? What was he like in his, in his most vulnerable moments? And, you know, I understand that people, you know, don't want to share that, you know, it's private and it's personal. And it took a lot, you know, of, um, I had to share a lot overshare yeah. a lot about myself yeah. with them so that they trusted me yeah i get it and so you know there was a lot of times we ended up you know some conversations went on for five six hours and i'm going on about all my stuff you <laughs> yeah. know just so they were like oh okay cool you need to i needed to convince them that i was i was getting involved to try and you know create something real in support of the family and support of the story you know not you know i want to understand bob in the best way possible you can't play someone you can't play anyone if you don't understand them from the beginning and what, you know. You can't you can't have committed to anything more than this interview as well as you have done. It's, oh, your commitment you, in this interview oh. is a testament to your commitment throughout the whole project. Oh, thank you, man. I'm on one. I, can't, I, I, love, can I love talking it's about Bob. I love talking about him. Uh, can we just change the next song for a bit more, Bob, if that's all right? Uh, the One Love concert that you recreated... Um, how how was that? How many people were actually there? What's the most people you played to? It was we'd done a lot of stuff before, right. you know, in London we'd done some concerts, but I, I hadn't I hadn't been on stage in front of thousands of Jamaicans, so 
you know and that happened yeah there was a when i was in jamaica there was a night where you know there was going to be a lot of jamaicans looking at me on stage and you know i could feel the en- i could feel the energy yeah. of let's see what this guy yeah, got gee, oh you know? my god you know? i'm not sure but you know, anybody would want to swap no, places with you do you know what's amazing though yeah. on stage yeah. ziggy had um a group of elder rasta men right who some of whom knew bob yep. and were on stage with him and they, those guys come with this magical energy you know they, I remember they came and sat down at like two, three o'clock in the afternoon. They didn't move. They didn't move. You know, we were shooting till like one, two in the morning. They yeah. were still sitting there. No one went to the toilet, nothing. They just were in this zone. And every time I'd walk past them, they'd just take me in and like acknowledge me. It sounds so... No, it like, doesn't. Pretend. It sounds it like so, they were there to do a job. They came in support and love of Bob and they believe in the spirit of him and they were just like, this is the guy who's doing it. And they, I could feel... Let's give him what he needs. I, yeah, I could feel that, 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 wow. that energy. There was so much love in Jamaica. I was in Trenchtown where everyone was telling me like Trenchtown's dangerous and Trenchtown's this and Trenchtown that. I never felt more loved than when I was in Trenchtown. I swear, to, we were in Trenchtown. We filmed for three days as a scene where Bob's driving through, you know, and the police stop him. And every time they call cut, I had to walk back down all the way down and we'd just stop and talk to people. You know, people were coming out of their houses and like it was amazing i didn't really get to see when i was filming i didn't get to go off and do too much because i was always on set i was always in the makeup chair we were finishing at nine i had to sleep prep for the next day so when we were filming in the communities that bob grew up in that was my time to like really be with people and and talk to people and i really I loved, I loved that time in <laughs> Trenchtown. So I was like, Trenchtown, I was like, Trenchtown ain't, Trenchtown's nice. We're over time, but uh, I could talk to you all morning. And I know you could talk to me all morning about yeah. this, probably for the rest of our life. I mean, you sort of want a career-defining role and you sort of don't, because obviously you're you're halfway, if that, through your own career. Uh, but that's what this might end up being, isn't it? I mean, I suppose that has to be okay. It has to be amazing. Um, what do you, where, where'd you go next? I don't know really. I just want to just I'm look. Who cares? Yeah, I, I, I'm just, I, honestly. <laughs> what would I, Bob do? I, yeah, honestly, I'm just taking one of these. De- I'm just trying to enjoy each one of Good these days, you, you know, and and talking about Bob and and um, you know what's wonderful about Bob? We went to the Brixton Pop thing the other day, and the goodwill and the love of Bob. I was reminded. I was like, people are coming to see him. You know, people are coming to see Bob, and like, I find that really. I have such a warm thing, you know, like this movie's about him. It's not about like me and my career and all of that. I'm not even trying to be like, like modest or like, it just feels like this is a moment to celebrate him. And I always felt like I was in service to the family. Yeah, yeah. So like, it was always about checking in with what they want. If the family come and told me that it's the fa- the story the family wanted to tell. So I really felt, normally you make, get a character or you get a job and you go like, I'm going to make this, you know, I'm, I'm, I, you do your work in your bedroom, you think about it and you come on and this is what I'm offering. Yeah. But with this, it really wasn't like that. It was, there was only so far I could get. And then I had to involve them and they were involved all the way through my process, all the way through the shoot to the last day, even to now, you know, it's, it's really, um, yeah, celebrating Bob. Well, I'm, I've got a hat on. I'm not going to take it off because I'm having a bad hair day, but I'll definitely doff my cap to you, um, uh, to, to Kingsley Benadir, Ni nee Barack Obama, Malcolm X, Bob Marley, with a bit of basketball Ken throwing bit of basketball Thank Ken. you, mate. That's awesome. You're <laughs> oh, awesome. That's on. Well done, well good done, man. You, man. That was good so good. So you. good. Still on. Kingsley Benadir spilling the beans on his new film, Bob Marley, One Love, released nationwide, worldwide, Wednesday, February 14th. Virgin Radio.